I remember my counselor saying to me, do you know what happens to, to Navy SEALs that never turn that part of their brain back on? They, they're the people that end up in shooting somebody out of road rage at an intersection. Because there's a reality to compassion and joy and anger and sadness that if you never turn that part of your brain back on to feel those things, you become very unhealthy. And, and it will come out some way. And if there's one plea, if you're that one and you're listening and you're like, I've been numb for a long time, and I would say this specifically to leaders, because we've been there. I mean, part of that season I just mentioned, Zach was transitioning our church. He had been leading so hard and so long that he was completely burnt out. That's why he was in depression. So we, we get leadership. And I would just say, if that's you and you've been there for so long, I would just say, let me motivate you out of your friendships, your children, your grandchildren. It does come out. I mean, we all know the cranky granddad that nobody wants to go visit. We all know them. Like that's, that's a reality. Why? Because they never dealt with their interior life and what they were feeling and they stuffed it and it comes out comes out some way or another. Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. It's Carrie here, and I hope our time together today helps you thrive in life and leadership. Welcome to this channel. If you're new here, make sure you subscribe. We drop all of our episodes here. And if you're enjoying it, make sure you leave a comment. Tell us what you appreciated about this episode. So today I've got Jenny Allen on. Man, this is a personal conversation. We talk about something that happened at an event that we were at together. We talk about the next generation untangling your emotions, being numb in leadership, and a whole lot more. And today's episode is brought to you by Subsplash. You know, you could join over 17,000 other churches who use Subsplash to make discipleship in a digital reality possible. So you can join today at subsplash.com slash carry where you can learn more and you'll get a discount. Also, make sure you check out Glue's new marketplace. You know, Easter is almost here, but it's not too late to make it a great weekend experience. They've got everything you need from worship to kids men to admin help, whatever else you need at Glue's marketplace. You can go to glue.us slash Easter and check it out before it's too late. And now my conversation with Jenny Allen. Jenny, it's a joy to have you back on the podcast. Welcome. I always love being here, Carrie. It's so fun to be with you and yeah, we'll we'll get into it. <laughs> We're gonna get into it. Okay. You even said we you might flip do. the mic. Yeah. We always we, do. <laughs> you might flip the mic, which will be fun. Um, yeah. hey, I want to start here. We see a shift happening. Something is changing, yeah. a kind of awakening. Um you know, we saw it in Asbury over a year ago. You were in on some of the college baptisms, et cetera. But then we were in a room together in early December of 2023, and there was maybe 200 relatively influential church leaders there, and you really challenged us. Can, can you talk about what happened that night? Well, I'd be more curious what you would say happened that night. <laughs> I, was, I was nervous. I felt like the Lord had given me a word, and this was a a crew that anyone would be intimidated to speak in front of, more or less call out possibly sin or bring correction to. It was not exactly what I wanted to go with, <laughs> but yeah. I had been reading um, specifically about revivals. And so much of what I read was that it began in rooms like that where there was real confession and and I think that room wants revival, right? Like as leaders, we of course want to see this spread and we want to see it never stop while we're alive. We want God to do a special work in our generation. Maybe that's ego or maybe that's just a deep, true longing for God. And I think either way, that's a good desire. And and so I think a room like that wants that, but yet are we willing to pay the cost to get there? And that's you know, I've been wrestling. It's not like I got up there to just call y'all out. I've been wrestling with that myself of just how do I truly live out what I'm calling other people to do? And and so that night, I mean, again, you really will have to tell me because I was so nervous uh, that I was shaking and I, I don't do that very often anymore. <laughs> um, but but I, I, I think I wanted to give room for prayer and for repentance and for people to encounter God. And so 
yeah, I left space for that. And, and just wanted, I just want, I think in moments like that, I have to decide, am I here to please man or am I here to please God? And I really had to lay down my desire to please the people in the room and just say what he had put on my heart. And it was really beautiful. And people wept and people, I believe, confessed and met God. And it was really, it was a sweet, he, he showed up. It was sweet. Yeah, it was one of those things where, uh, you know, we spent three days together. It was an invite-only list of just leaders who were involved in different projects. And, um, you know, we get a lot of content. I'll tell you, you produce content, I produce content. We get a lot of content. And you got up there and basically you were shaking. I was near the front and I saw that. It wasn't a big room. And you just kind of called us out and said, you know, what? what do we need to confess before God? Because that's how revival starts. And you said something interesting, which is, do we really want a revival? We say we do, but do we really want it? Because it might disrupt the way we do church, or it might disrupt our business model, or it might disrupt uh, our really comfortable path that we all have Mm. planned out. And what do you, you know, so for me, just to to let people know, I thought, uh-oh, what are we going to have to confess? And it was group confession. We were sitting in groups. So you're sitting with other leaders and you're like, I sort of know these people. What am I going to, what am I going to say? And the Holy Spirit brought to mind for me, it wasn't like, you know, I was thinking some secret sin or something like that. It was like, no, 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 no. That's not that but you're shirking, you're shrinking. I remember talking to you about it after, before dinner or after dinner, um, where I was shrinking back from my calling. Mm. And mm. I felt like Jesus said, stand up. And it was really uncomfortable to me. So I actually stood up when everybody else was seated during that prayer time. Mm. And like, I don't do that. You know what I mm. mean? I'm not, I'm not charismatic. Yeah. Especially maybe if I was in the back corner of the room, Jenny, I would have been comfortable standing up where the lights were low. But I'm in the middle. I don't know who's looking, who's not. I stood up. And it was a really, I've thought about that time a lot. And I prayed about it. And I don't know exactly what it means. Um, I have an idea. And so like I'm planning a few things for later this year to try to speak up on issues that I would normally not speak up on. Mm. And it was really powerful. I don't know whether you have other reports from that yeah. night. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there were, it was so funny because every report was just wildly different from the sure. uh, the next, which I love that about God. Right. And it's yeah. why you just got to do what he says. Right. And I've learned that just if he says, get up and say this, get up and say it. If he says, leave room for prayer, leave room for prayer. If he says, tell everybody to confess, do it. I've just learned to do what he says because he has a plan and he wants to do something that I would get in the way of if I tried to to control it. And so it was really sweet. I mean, it, I felt really moved by the whole experience as well because I think he is real. <laughs> and oh, yeah. in moments like that, you just know it and you you know it through how he can do a thousand different things in a room. And and really, mostly what I did, I think I had, they'd given me like 20 minutes to talk. And I think I talked for a few. And then mostly I just let it be really quiet. Yeah, it was about five minutes. And then we yeah, went it was, to prayer. It, and then it was prayer. And it was just everybody was alone with God. And I think, you know, sometimes that's the brave move is just to be quiet. <laughs> yeah. And to just let God work. And and He's he will and he does. So it was fun. It was fun to hear everybody's different, what he told them and what happened in that time. Yeah. You know, what's interesting to me too is of all the different talks over three days, that's the one that pops mm. to mind. That was sort of the defining wow. moment for me of of the experience. I want to ask a, an unanswerable question, I think, because <laughs> I also had a, a short presentation at that thing and it was, I wrote it custom for that, but it wasn't Mm -hmm. nearly as profound as yours. It was just on post-Christian culture and what we need to pay attention to. And then I did a bunch of interviews, which was, you know, sort of my wheelhouse. But I I felt like I prayed about it. And I Mm -hmm. felt like I said what I was supposed to say, which was not a stock talk that I normally give. How did you know, here's the unanswerable question. How did you know that it was God? How did you, how did you come to that realization or it wasn't just, you know, 
your own feeling or your own insecurity or something like that popping up? No, sometimes I appreciate this, that somebody told me that you never know it's God until it happens. And that's pretty Mm. true. And there's plenty of times that things have fallen flat. I I mean, what actually comes to mind when you tell this is a story I told it. I'm remembering I told the story about the worst talk I'd given. I don't know if you remember this part of it. And that I... I got up there and it felt, it was, you know, I'd had all these incredible moments with young adults. Almost every time I'm with them, like something kind of dramatic happens. And I was at Texas A&M and I was giving the talk and I could feel in the room like a sense of oppression and distraction. And I just, it didn't feel like it was landing at all. And I, and I didn't tell this part of the story, but it turns out what I shared that night was just that I had had an unconfessed sin that I needed to confess. And he revealed that to me the next morning, but I had will I had knowingly disobeyed him that day. And even in my mind thought, I know what you told me to do and I'm not going to do it that day. So I, you know, and, and so I felt like the Lord was just teaching me. But again, the night, I was a little embarrassed because it's, Texas A&M is where my kids go to school. Um, I am very connected to the leadership there. It just, it wasn't like one of those places you're, oh, that didn't go so well and walk away. So I was a little embarrassed and mm. I and I asked them actually to take the message down and just, you know, all that to say, it, yeah. that's where I was. Well, the funny thing is since then, all these stories have come out of that message. And I think you don't know what he's doing. Um, this, this couple came across the street randomly before my message and they had come to Breakaway a million times. They, they helped with worship. And everybody had been praying that they would be saved because they worked with the crew. They weren't believers. And they randomly walked over after eating dinner and came in. And late, like weeks later, I heard that they both prayed to receive Christ after that message. And I'm going, it really was, I'm not just being, I'm not just being, you know, coy. I, it wasn't a mm-hmm. good message. I was distracted the whole time because I could feel the tension. I could tell it wasn't landing. So all that to say, I don't think we have a clue what what we you know to some degree there's a surrender of like Lord if it's foolishness because I could have looked like a fool up there I mean I really could have I was I, it could have gone differently and I would say unless God entered the room it wasn't impressive and and so I think where we've got to go is I'm willing I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do and. And that might be the obvious thing. And for you that night, Carrie, I can assure you, I wasn't there, by the way. I had jury duty, y'all. That's why I had to leave. Oh, yeah, that's but, right. Um, <laughs> I told you to go to law school and become but a lawyer. I didn't lawyer. actually, that's I can't speak to the it. talk, but I can say yeah. that I know it was impactful and I know it mattered. And I think we just, because you were obedient, you, you sought the Lord and he gave you what to do. Sometimes that results in some profound thing and sometimes it results in what looks like failure. But then later, there's fruit from it. And so I just think this is less about um, the outcome and more about an individual relationship with God where we're learning to just trust Him and listen and walk. I mean, I remember the minute before I got up there to do that thing. And it got worse as I was sitting over there because I was looking over my notes and I saw a quote that I hadn't seen before in the in the research that I'd done on that uh, revi- that specific revival. And it was that one quote at the end, and I can't remember it now, but it, it basically was, how dare we pray for everybody else to meet Jesus when we won't even meet Jesus ourselves? Like something that it was just, con- it was convicting on our level. And I was like, oh, did I have to read that? Shoot. So it was getting worse as I was sitting over there, like, this is gonna be harsh. And I remember just telling the Lord, I'm like, well, I pick you. And if I look like a fool, I look like a fool. Let's go. And I think that attitude has served me well of just, okay, let's go. And I think sometimes that polish and that, you know, we all come in with different roles in the kingdom. I'm the, hello, I'm your best friend and I'm going to beat you up a little. Like that's kind of my role lots of times. (laughs) Sure, fair. And I think everybody's got different roles. And I think, um, yeah, it's just, but it doesn't always, it doesn't always end well, that's for sure. Well, that one ended really well. And I can imagine being you, and I've definitely been 
not in identical situations, but similar ones where it felt pre-orchestrated, manipulated, a little bit manipulative. Oh, here we go. Uh, it didn't feel that way at all. It just yeah. felt raw. It felt authentic. It was raw. I could tell you were vulnerable. <laughs> I could yeah. see it. Yeah. And I think that's so much of it too. I think, I think I've learned in my writing and in my leadership to just be the fool. <laughs> mm. And I think that that goes a long way with people. I think they're like, oh, okay. And and not everybody needs to play that role. I'm sure glad my neuro doctor doesn't play that role, right? <laughs> I want him, <laughs> I don't want him to be the fool. I want him to be smart and right and and composed. So, you know, we just each have different parts to play. Yeah. And uh, so I'm really grateful for that night. And, you know, you have a real heart for the next generation. I think a great connection with the next generation. I'm sensing, I'm trying to put little clues together. I haven't got them all together, but trying to sense where's the church going, what's happening. And one of the themes that I see, one of the trends that I see is more moments like that. Authenticity, Mm. raw confession. When you look at the next generation, the students you're meeting at Texas A&M, your own kids, their friends, uh, the tens of thousands of young people you would speak to every year. What are you seeing, Jenny? Mm, I think that's really true. And I, you know, when I think about them, I'm so proud of them. I think they are fierce. And the ones that love God, love God. There's just no fake Christians left in mm. this generation. There is no point. Um, there's no reason to pretend anymore. And so that's that, that's who I'm drawn to. I think that's why we've found each other. It's yeah. that 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 works for me. Um I, I didn't millennials were great. And I mean certainly a lot of our ministry is is that age group, a lot of it. Mm. But I would just say when I ended up in rooms with what became later Gen Z, I didn't even know they were called Gen Z at the time. I was like, something just shifted. They're they're confessing sin without me barely asking. They're coming to the stage and wanting Jesus. There, there was a hunger. There was a desire for God in a way that was so sincere and radical and different. And I think it's just, I mean, to give, you know, the generations above a little credit, you know, there had to be a deconstruction for us to come back. It's, it's, there's, it's the process of generations. Mm-hmm. You can see through every generation, the building up, the tearing down, the, the hopelessness of, a generation that's that doesn't have God, and then the revival and the awakening, and they come back to God, and that's pretty consistent throughout history. You know that this is how it goes, and so I look at this generation, and of course, it's their time. It's their time, and they're going to bring revival. It's it was due, and and for a long time, when you just get God and He's everywhere, and it's easy. You take him for granted, and that's just not them. They've had to fight. If they believe in God, they've had to fight their way through, claw their way through persecution in their public schools. They've had to claw their way through college campuses where they're offered not just alcohol or even marijuana. It's every kind of hard drug um, and every kind of sexual temptation. I mean, it's just all there for them, and they're sick of it. And that's what I see. Mm. I see that they have tasted what the world has to offer faster and in more um, in a more robust way. And they're just, they, it's like they want to spit it out and as fast, as soon as you give them the chance to do it, they want to do it. And, you know, I, one of the things you referenced was the baptisms. I mean, it was in Auburn and we just, at the end of the, the program that night, we still had more to do actually, but somebody wanted to be baptized. I got up, I said, does anybody else want to be baptized? And and all these hands went up. I was like, okay, well, we're going to go down to the lake, down the street. And I mean, there were 2,000 people around the lake. Like it was, wow. <laughs> like I didn't know it hardly because I'm just sitting there baptizing, baptizing. And we're hearing their story and getting their testimony, make sure they're, you know, following Jesus or want to follow Jesus. And every once in a while, I'd turn around and the entire lake was surrounded by people watching. They couldn't even hear, but they wanted to be there. I mean, it was, I was like, golly, they mm. want God. They want God. And every kid I baptized, I said, why are you here? Why do you want to do this tonight? And it was the same kind of stories. It was, I'm sick of my sin. I'm sick. I want to be clean. 
I want to be right with God. Mm. I'm sick of running away from Him. I want to run toward Him. Those were, it was over and over and over again. It's, I'm sick of the world. I don't want this anymore. I want God. It just gives me chills. It makes me teary because you can't, I mean, you can't, we can all want that to happen. We can all pray for that to happen. But God has to do that. You can't force that in a room. You know, it's just, he has to make it happen. And and it's happening. It's happening everywhere I go. You know, you you sort of said something quickly and it gave me a framework. I just want to test it out. It feels like boomers and Gen X deconstructed the church. Fair? Like we're like, we don't want to do church the way our parents did church. Pardon mm-hmm. me. And then millennials come along and there's a big deconstruction of faith. Now, there's a lot of millennials who are still Christians, et cetera, et cetera. And it almost feels like Gen Z could be the people who reconstruct church again. Absolutely. It's time. It's their job. And Mm. I think as, you know, I wouldn't say, I I would disagree a little with that statement. And I know what you, I think I know what you mean. We built our our different ways of doing church. We we changed the way church was being done. But if you really just keep it at a faith level, you have the Jesus revolution of my parents' age. Mm. And then you have, so they were boomers. And then I'm like right at the top of millennial Gen X. So in in that moment, there's a, we got God. Like we heard about him in Awanas and we heard, you know, our parents were taking us to church. There was revival had happened in their generation coming out of the seventies and the sex and drugs and all that. They were, to me, they are the parallel generations. The mm. <laughs> Crazy enough. The boomers and the Zs are, are so similar. They, they had this awakening sexually and, and drugs and the world. And then they, they got sick of it and wanted God. So if you just keep it on a faith level, I really think they were revivalists. And I think X was enjoying the fruit of that, right? Like we were mm-hmm. raised and and we were, it was kind of the Christian and, and there's brokenness, the purity culture. There's, there's stuff that was damaging in some of that. But then you get to millennials and that damage now was the story, right? It wasn't any longer about the story of God or the story of faith. By that point, it was like, gosh, these are all the broken things that has become. But then you get to Z and they they didn't get God, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, most most of them, like their parents barely went to church, if at all. Um, they largely were raised by YouTube stars and TikTokers. So they didn't get God. And then then when they hear it, they're like, this is the greatest thing ever. So I think, you know, and, and again, no offense to millennials in this storyline, because sometimes I think they get a bad rap. I actually think that it had to, deconstruction had to happen. If there wasn't a pruning, there wouldn't be growth and fruit. So there had to be a fr- pruning of the issues in the church. The, the, a lot of the, the systems were really, really toxic and broken and nobody was calling it out. So I do think there had to be a pruning and a reconciling of those things before revival could come again. But I think a lot of those things are, are getting reconciled and revival is for sure coming. And really at this moment, which is really fun, nobody's arguing it. You know, mm. for a long time, we were like, I think revival's coming, revival's coming. And it's like, oh, okay, it's come. It's here. <laughs> we're in the middle of it. It's happening. You saw it passion. I mean, they, they're just mm-hmm. worshiping in the quiet. Like, and I saw it that night when I'm with leaders and it could have gone in either way, but all those leaders, it wasn't just you standing. There were actually so many people in the room standing and there were so many people on their knees and faces. And there were so many people crying. Like, I think there's an awakening happening in people that that they want, they want God. And that is revival. (laughs) (laughs) When our hearts want God more than any other thing, that is revival. That's the thing we're praying for. And I'm seeing that more and more and more. And this world is growing strangely dim in light of it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's exciting. What else are you seeing? Oh, I see a lostness, and I'm not talking about Gen Z. I'm talking about people. I think we are, there's a hopelessness and a lostness of um, where, do, where am I needed? What role do I play? How do I help? Um, I think people want to help, and they want to believe they have something to contribute. And what I would say to that is, 
as someone who gets to be on the front lines of the Gen Z conversation, and I mean, I'll be at probably five college campuses in the next six weeks or so, seven weeks. So I'll say this. Um, we need you to be making disciples. <laughs> we need you to step up. We Pastors, we need, I know a lot of you are out there listening to this. We need you to come around with your churches and and see that generation, not to focus everything on them, but to unleash your people to help disciple them. A lot of them didn't have healthy parents. I mean, I, I remember sitting there with some girls I was discipling and telling them some real basic, basic things like don't gossip. And they were like, why? Really? I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> what What do you mean? Don't go- You've never heard that? Like, how, how did you, like that, my mom told me that every week, like through Skip middle school. a generation likely, or right? two. Yeah. But it's like, but, but I think parenting, I just think they, they were raised by their devices. And so we've got, we just have a parenting gap. And so a lot of parents are needed in the church to make disciples and to adopt, you know, spiritually speaking, um, these kids in and to, you have a purpose. We need you. We really need you to help take what I see as sparks flying everywhere and grow it into mature believers that are ready to lead what's coming. Often the revival, the little pockets, the sparks that we see emerge are happening on the edge of church. We've talked about Mm -hmm. seminaries. We talked about uh, universities, colleges, talked about passion and 60, 70,000 kids at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta when you think about the local church, and there are over 300,000 churches in America alone, what is standing in the way of revival coming to the local church level? I mean, that day, like when I'm talking to all those leaders, it's confession. I think we've got to quit wanting to change the world and start to change our hearts and focus on our hearts. We want the next generation to love God, but we're never sitting back thinking, do we love God? Like not just a um, token morality, political attendance to church thing, but I do I love God more than any other thing on earth? Do I want God more than any other thing on earth? And I think when we start to turn and see our own sin, that's when you see, I mean, what is the word revival? We're all praying for it, but I don't know that we often think what the word actually means. And it is actually not necessarily, although part of the result is unbelievers becoming believers, but it's largely reviving those in the church. It's taking someone who already knows God, but their heart has grown cold or distant or sinful and bringing it back to life, right? That's technically what the term is. So so I would just say, well, that means that our, our most urgent work is ourselves as a church, our most urgent, if we want revival, it, it has to start in our own heart with our own need for revival. And I think we tend to pray for the world that's so broken out there. It's getting so dark. Everything's so broken. What's going to happen to our grandkids and our kids? And, and, oh, this generation is so, you know, far from God and they're so selfish. And I'm like, well, actually, what about you? <laughs> What about, yeah. what about you? Like, are you not selfish? Are you not broken? Are you not, are you like Christ? You know, and I think that's where I get excited is I'm seeing it and where I'm really believing is it's going to change is I'm seeing it spread into, into other generations. It's not stopping with Gen Z, just like that day. I mean, that day was all different ages, mostly older than me. And so I just think that's, that's where we, we've got to want God more and we've got to confess and see our own sin and our own contribution to the need of, for Jesus to die. One of the things that I think characterizes not just your writing, but your leadership and who you are on and off stage is you're incredibly vulnerable. You know, I was reading through your new book, Untangling Your Emotions and or Untangle Your Emotions. And I'm like, I it's just, it feels very natural, like not inappropriate. It's not voyeurism or anything, but I'm like, 
wow, that's a level of rawness, rawness and authenticity that a lot of people don't have. Yeah. Did that come naturally to you? How did you, <laughs> you know. develop that? No. And no, in fact, my friends would say it's really hard for me to share what's really going on in the moment. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll be really candid. It's worked. I mean, I, I just, on a core level, like my mind needed to see it was worth it. And what I mean by that is not just like it's work, like it's sold books. I don't mean that at all. It, I mean, I mean, when I share, it makes me cry. When I share my doubt, other people can share their doubt. And when I share my anger at a child that feels ungrateful for, for what, how we've loved them and helped raise them, they share about their child that is rebelling. When I share about the feelings I have that are embarrassing because I really shouldn't be feeling them, and I know you're probably going to judge them, but I'm going to share them anyway, and, and I wince a little, that makes you think of your feelings that you don't want to share. And so I think I've just, I've seen it help people, and I've seen it set people free. And I think, I, I, I really do think a lot about heaven, maybe more than most people, maybe every day. And I think about, which means you think about death. I, re- yep. I really need to get more on board with Jesus coming back because then I'm not so quite so. Um, I think about death fatalistic. a lot too. Believe it or not, you're not alone. Yeah, and and I think it, when I think that way, I just think, well, what's the end game? What are we doing? Because I don't have a big stomach for marketing or or just doing the next thing because I'm supposed to do it and I've been successful at it. I, I mean, I really am in this, got into it, and still am in it for the glory of God and for heaven and what happens to people. And so when I think about that as the end goal, then I want to do what Paul did, which is by any means possible, like by every means possible, whatever I have to do to help someone see their need for God, to help someone see their need for connection with other people, to help someone see their need for for healing, then okay, and it's worked. And I don't know anything that works better than you going first and saying what is hard for you to say. And to do it, and it's got to be sincere. You're right. It, if it isn't sincere, if it isn't genuinely scary for me to share something, I mean, I'm always embarrassed at the books that are out there. And I won't go back and reread them after I'm done with my editing. Like, I don't go back and read Get Out of Your Head and for, because it's embarrassing. I put things in there that I truly felt embarrassed to share. I, there are things in this book I feel embarrassed to share. Now, that's not to say I don't see the glory of God healing me and all the beauty that's come from it, but it still is not the easy story to tell, which, in my experience, makes it very, and it's just in that very fact, real, because it genuinely scares me and it genuinely is embarrassing. And if I'll go to that place, and I call it like humility and humiliation are very close together. I think they're they're cousins, very close cousins. And humility has most often come for me in the form of humiliation. And it's a way, it is a form of humiliation to share the hardest stuff. But I'm also like, what game are we playing if we don't? Who am I to pretend that that I have it together while everybody else I know on earth that has ever been honest with me is falling apart? What a crappy disservice to people if that's how I'm going to play this. I get a platform and I'm going to play it as I'm an expert and I've got something. No, I'm going to play it as I'm as screwed up as you. Here's what God's done in my life. This is how my life has changed. And as I do that, then it's so much more fun because then it's like one of, I'm one of all the people I want to be a part of and close to. So it's, it's worked for me even on a, friendship level. Like I don't see myself different. I'm like, yeah, we're all screwed up, feeling our way to God, doing the best we can. And you really aren't going to shock me with anything you say, because I probably thought it, done it, said it, certainly seen it. <laughs> so just bring it. And I think that, that, but yet I want God with all my heart. And in the, you know, again, my life theme book is Pilgrim's Progress. I talk about it all the time. Mm-hmm. I feel I am Christian. I am I met God. 
I fell in love with him, but I seemed to keep ending up in these different stops that I didn't mean to. But my journey through that helps people. So that was a really long answer. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very helpful and truthful answer. And I think yeah. I think the thing about your writing, our mutual friend, Ann Voskamp, with whom I've had a conversation, she's incredibly vulnerable too about yeah. her past struggles. I think, you know, Ann would say that women have to do that. It's the cost of admission, the price of admission. Totally. And she would say, why can't I just be a guy? I'm, I'm paraphrasing her a little bit, but she'll correct me and let you know if I'm wrong and if you're listening. Um, but Ann Voskamp would say, because she said this to me on this podcast, you know, if I was a guy, I could have screwed up 20 years ago and then I get to write about it all in the past tense. But as a woman, it feels like the price of admission to have to I totally, be able to- I'm going to disagree with my dearest friend. I love her so much. We've okay. been friends for 10 years. That is- no, men need to grow in this. Oh, That's I think she I like said, that. she would say we do, but she's saying yeah, a lot I of men think, don't take okay, that posture. Price to yeah, I, I would say you're right. If we don't do it right, there's, yes, they, we don't have credibility. But you're right. But I think, I hope that changes. I mean, I think it's changing. I hope changing. it does too. And I think she does. I mean, I think it's changing. Carrie, that's why I like you so much. I mean, you come up to me after that talk and you're crying and you're, you're feeling all of this and you're sharing it with me. There's no pride. There's no um, separation. There's just, this is what I'm struggling with. I think that's one, peop one reason people love interviewing with you and people love listening to you. I think that's true. And I think that's what people are longing for, right? I mean, we're starving for, I was on a, I was on an interview with Ed Stetzer about this topic of emotions and I turned it on him and talked about, um, what he was feeling. He told this little story about baseball and he, he teared up. It was like a seven-year-old story where he got cut from a team that his dad was coaching and he, he didn't make the team. And he just, and I mean, I started crying. It's baseball. It's seven-year-olds. I'm crying. He's crying. Anyone listening was crying. And I'm just saying that was tender for him to share. I don't know if he's ever shared that in a public way. And I mean, he may even regret it. Like he may have even cut it out. I don't know if it ended up in the interview or not. But I'm telling you, it was one of the best things I've ever heard. And I've never forgotten it since he shared it. And it makes me like Ed even more. And I already right? like him. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's what we're talking about is this thing that feels, you know, I call it the last 2%. And I got that from our local church. That last 2% that you're scared to say, it's in that thing, it's in that 2% that the enemy has all its hold or, or the best of life and the best of God and the best of connection with other people is found. That thing that you think I can tuck that away and I'll be vulnerable, but I'm not gonna share that. That's too vulnerable. That too vulnerable part distances you from everyone else because the vulnerable that's acceptable is not actually that vulnerable. That's just a tool you pull out to um, look approachable, relatable, likable, whatever. That 2% that nobody shares, that everybody cringes just a little that you shared and that you're cringing that you shared, that's the part that's like the most human. It's a secret. It's the place. It's the place God, God meets you. It's the place other people get you for the first time. Because you didn't share it. You risk something, right? It's like, mm -hmm. golly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. And, and, I, and that's what I, going back to Gen Z, that's what they're great at. If there's one thing that happens the most is confession with them. And I mean, they say everything. I, it's unbelievable. I remember I, when I spoke at Passion a couple years ago and I had them do conf confession and I was like, I don't know how this is going to go. I think Louie was like, I don't know how this is going to go. They'd never done that. And I just said, turn to your two neighbors and say something. I'm telling you, this week, I heard one to two stories of things people confessed, you know, that many years ago and how he set them free in that moment and how embarrassed they were to say the word masturbation. And they said it. And, and then the person across from them said the same word. And the two of them have held each other accountable all these years later, and they are free from that struggle. And, and it's like, God, I hear those stories all the time because they just are brave enough to say the thing other people won't say. 
yeah, probably I mean, should think- say, I should probably say the word pornography because that's a little more acceptable, but the word was. You can you can say what you want to say. You well, know, you can edit it out too. Oh, uh, we won't. You know, <laughs> Jenny, it's 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 like I, just to you know, in the spirit of going first, I think I said it once on this podcast, but a year ago, my wife and I we set goals every year, and one of them, I'm like, hey, what kind of husband do I need to be? And she said, often around dinner, it gets tense because you like it at a certain point, and then you're complaining, and it's difficult, and you're not nice to be around. And I'm like, fair. And so one of my top goals for 2023 was positive kitchen. That's it. Positive Mm. kitchen. Now there's a part of me that wishes that was 15 years ago. And there's a part of me as a 58 year old man who's like, how come I haven't nailed this? (laughs) And of course I haven't. Right. And there's going to be stuff that I'm working on. And that's a small thing. I said to my group that was gathered around for dinner, told them about something else we're working on in our marriage right now. And I don't know that one's ready for public consumption, but like to say it out loud and say, this is something Tony and I are working on for this year was like really good and very embarrassing. Okay, Carrie, we're about to talk about emotions in this book. I'm going to just go ahead and turn it on you now, because I would say that at that time of day, there's probably a reason it's hard for you to be kind, and it probably has nothing to do with your marriage or your wife. Oh, okay. I think I'm just tired. So at that time of day, you've lived a lot of the day, and you picked up along the way probably lots of little anxieties or tensions or things that need to be done or places that you've got to deliver or measure up. And so all of that's now accumulated over a week, a month, whatever, and you come into the meal. And now there's there's another point of, I've got to show up here and do something. So I would be more curious if you can think of one night that you remember feeling that feeling of anxiety or stress or tension that you, that made it not positive kitchen night. And maybe it's even a night that you faked it and you got through it, but but what is the feeling you're feeling in that moment? In that, and, and I'd sp- stick to a specific night. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking through. We did make a lot of progress on it. So it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Uh, one of the things I think I feel at the end of the day is a lack of control. You can, you can analyze my entire life through the lens of control, and it gets... Very depressing and what, very quickly. So that so that is not a feeling. Oh. But you. what does, that's okay. I want you to cr- describe a feeling that you feel because of the lack of control. Um, anger. Oh. Yep. Okay. What are you angry at? Mm, the fact that probably it doesn't have to do with the kitchen uh, it probably has more to do with the fact that something didn't go my way or I didn't get done everything I wanted to get done or this wasn't predictable. So it just gets extrapolated onto the kitchen dynamic. Okay. So now I want you to think about the first time you remember feeling that chaos, and feeling that anger and feeling like nothing is in your control. I want you to try to remember the first time you remember feeling that feeling. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, I was a little kid, my probably under three, because we moved when I was three. Wow. I have a lot of memories as a child. Wow. And I remember being terrified. My parents, we lived on a farm for the first three years. My parents had a house. My grandparents lived, haven't been there in years, 100, 200 feet down the road, but the road wasn't a road. It was a sidewalk on a big farm property. And I was wandering over to my grandparents' house and we had a dog that was behind, I guess, a chain link and it started barking its head off at me. And Mm -hmm. I remember just being absolutely terrified and out of control and I didn't know what to do. And I looked around and there was nobody to rescue me. Mm -hmm. And that was terrifying. To this day, I'm not an animal person. I mean, if you're nice to me, I'll pet your dog and everything, but it's like, oh yeah, still don't like it. That 
probably is one of my first memories, if not the first memory, and it's not a good one. Mm. It's being scared. So, so when you today look at that little boy that was three years old, do you remember probably what you were wearing or what? Can you picture him? Kind of, yeah. I have an idea in my mind. Yeah. What I might have been what, younger. What do you I might have been two. What do you see? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Here we are, live therapy. Uh, this is really hard for me to answer. Uh, I see a boy who's going to be all right, but who feels utterly alone and who doesn't know what to do. What do you feel for him? Empathy, sadness. Why do you feel sad? I don't know. I don't know. Can I tell you what I see? Yeah. I see a little boy that understands nothing yet, except for fear (laughs) and anger. And as an adult, I look at that little boy and I'm like, I want to pick you up and I want to protect you and I want to make this right. And I'm going to, I'm going to bring what you can't produce on your own, which is protection and control. And I'm going to take care of you. And ultimately, that little two-year-old is, is still there. It's there at the kitchen at night. It's, it, that two-year-old is there with you all the time. And I know this sounds hokey, and probably some people are just about to quit, but we wonder why we do the things we do. And we wonder why we feel the things we feel. And God doesn't. (laughs) Like God knows because he built us and he knows every intricate detail of our lives that we forget. And he knows that ultimately that little boy wanted, longed for something that is good and right to be protected. Like that was broken and you were vulnerable. And and today, this is broken, and we are vulnerable, and we can't fix it all. And I would just say what I love about emotions is that they're actual tools to, like, help Mm -hmm. us deal with that fact. Yeah. And you want to hear something else crazy? Yeah. Like, what would you say to that little boy? I've never thought about this. Never, I've done a lot of therapy over the years. Never unpacked. I've unpacked that a little bit, but not this angle. You want to know how lies get lodged? Mm. Part of the voice in the back of my head is, and he should have known better. Wow. Like, where is that from, Jenny? That is dark. So, oh, my gosh. That is, I think, the most common thing. I found if if you want to know like the one thing I pray changes for people because of this book, it's that voice. That voice is so that voice is the judge. That's not the scared. That's not the scared little kid. That part. I have a judge in my head like you wouldn't believe. All of us do. I I think everybody does. You know why? Because anytime someone has ever sat across from me and started crying, what do they say? Every time, they say, "Sorry, I shouldn't feel this way." I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What is that? Why are they sorry? What are they sorry about? That is in everybody's head. We all Mm. feel guilty for how we feel. We all feel like we shouldn't feel this way. We shouldn't feel scared. We shouldn't have gotten ourselves in that situation. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have done that. And we think that voice is from God. There's a part of us. I, I'm watching it in my daughter right now. There's a part of us that can't turn the voice off because we think it's from God. And if we turn it off, that should voice that keeps saying you should or shouldn't do this or that, then we're going to go off the rails. And I had that same fear. I remember thinking, if I just feel what I feel, I'm going to go off the rails. I don't want to be overly emotional. I don't want to be controlled by my emotions, right? Certainly emotions have been demonized in the church and demonized all around us. And then also idolized and made into gods. You know, we've got the two yeah, extremes. All we have is our emotions. Uh-huh. Right. So we've got these two extremes and no healthy view of it. And and yet there is a way to feel 
God built us to feel. God feels. You see every single emotion in the Trinity. Um, you see fear. You see, see anger. You feel, see sadness. And if you don't believe me on the fear part, uh, most people believe the others, but because it's very well documented, is the Greek word where in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is facing his death is agonia, and it is most often translated into grief. I mean, not grief, um, anxiety or fear. Those are its two most basic translations. So you've got Jesus in the garden afraid of what he's facing the next day. So he's felt, he feels all those emotions. So we know that they're good because they're from God. We know that they're good because they're in God. But yet we, we, at the best, the church will do is call them neutral. But they're not neutral. They're good. And so that boy being afraid is good. Why? Mm-hmm. Because it was possibly dangerous. <laughs> That's sure. a gift from I God don't understand chain link. Are you kidding me? Yeah. yeah. So of course he feels afraid. And I would say, and this is where, you know, we can get into this theologically if you want. Um, I would say for you to be stressed at the end of a day, for you to feel overwhelmed by the day is a good feeling. Why? How can I say that? That feels heretical. And I would say the reason I can say that is because that is the reality. That is, when I think of truth, um, I think of God. When I think of truth, I think of the Bible. But when I think of truth, I also think of the truth of my circumstances. So the truth of this world, the truth of our sin, the truth. You, you don't just stop at the Bible and God. You, there's other things that are true, right? And so now they're all contained in God and because of God. But, but things are true. Things are overwhelming. So you feel overwhelmed. And let me give you a whole different vision. I I can't believe I'm doing this to you because I respect the heck out of you. But I'm going to want to change your positive kitchen stuff. Okay. I think the bigger, more beautiful thing than switching that over, just stuffing that overwhelmed feeling and going up and being nice during dinner and y'all having a great talk. And I mean, I'm judging this and I don't even know about it. You could tell me about it and I'd be like, just kidding. Let's, but, but I think my take on what you're saying is that we're not going to be negative. We're not going to, I'm not going to poke or pick or be critical. I'm going to be present and with you with good, good, good. But what if there was even a deeper layer where you, before you go up to the kitchen, you actually take inventory of your heart and like how you're feeling and what you're worried about and what that little gnawing tension is that you feel in your chest that you haven't really thought about all day, but it's been there. And you kind of give it a name and you go, okay, Lord, like this is what I'm feeling. And then you go upstairs and, and you're aware, you're aware that, gosh, I've got a disappointment. This morning I had this phone call and I felt like they were disappointed in something I'd done and it's kind of stuck with me all day. And you go upstairs and it's like, okay, that's the conversation. And it's like, well, and I think, and I'm not saying you don't have that conversation, but I do think that's the deeper thing we're afraid of. That yep. if, we, if we push down the overwhelmed and say it's negative, then we miss what it could teach us and lead us to, and specifically the connection it can bring in our lives. I love that practice. That's a great idea because I don't do that well, and self-awareness is is a growing edge for me, but like I don't take that time to collect myself before I walk up the stairs. I don't have a drive home these days, right? This is my office, and the kitchen is directly above me. And it's about five seconds to get there up the stairs from the basement. So I think that idea on a bad day, like when you're bouncing with good news, today was actually a really good day. So I got lots of positive to report, but on a bad day, you know, to do that. And the other thing, and I would just say this for anybody who has a similar dynamic, the the thing that Tony and I have isolated in our marriage at this point is a huge difference between turning to each other or turning on each other. And I don't want to speak for her, but when I have these sometimes unrecognized emotions at work in me and I come home and it's like, well, well, you said we're going to eat at six, but why are we eating at seven? And, you know, it's too late and I'm turning on her rather than turning to her, which requires me to say, hey, today didn't go the way as I planned. I'm not feeling great. I didn't sleep well last night. I'm out of energy. I'm really sorry. How can we make uh, dinner together or what can we do? The other thing I've started doing, we had an outdoor indoor division of labor and I just pleaded all ignorance on anything inside the kitchen. 
And that was sort of her responsibility. And then the barbecuing was mine and we barbecue a lot. But now I'm like, I'll grab a knife and I'll uh, I'll start. And I got rid of one of my pet peeves. So yeah, one of my new hobbies, one of my new hobbies is sharp kitchen utensils because I would pick up a, a knife and then it was dull. And I'm like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> you know, like this is stupid. So now I, I keep everything sharp and I get in there and I've learned how to cut vegetables and how to help. And she's sort of the head chef there and I'm sous chef. But I it's love that. working on it together and having a conversation. I would say nine out of 10 days, maybe 19 out of 20 are good days in the kitchen now. And I'm I'm trying to really focus on don't turn on her, turn to her. Beautiful. So yes. we're working That's on that. That's so beautiful. Well, we got other hills to That's... conquer too. Oh, me too. Right. <laughs> now you raised day. something that I don't want to gloss over because I think you're right. A lot of us grew up believing that emotions were to be ignored or they were bad things unless they were positive or we need to manage them. The number of times, I'll just talk my immediate friendship circle here. We were comparing over the weekend at, at dinner, um, you know, how did your family handle conflict? And mm -hmm. I think four out of six people are like, it was swept under the rug, just swept under the rug, right? Yeah. We didn't really have an argument, did we, Jenny? No, I don't think so. We're fine. We're good. Yeah. And, you know, we're all untangling that years later. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about what happens for probably the majority of us where our emotions were ignored, managed, or swept under the carpet? Well, we, we learn messages that live with us to this day, which is part of that judgmental self, right? Is that part of us that we're spending so much energy. Um, my counselor's Dr. Kurt Thompson. I have hit the jackpot there and he teaches me so much through his writing, but also just through our counseling sessions. And he just always would tell me, because I, I, I had to be convinced. I was someone who had to be convinced that this work was worth it. Cause I couldn't really figure out why to go back and think about my seven-year-old self or my 12-year-old self. That just felt like a waste of time. Why do that? Why go back to a moment that, that was so negative? And so I just remember him saying, well, you're wasting energy trying to suppress that, to control, to cope, to conceal that emotion. You're, you're spending a lot of energy on it. And that energy could be freed up and used other places. I mean, you'll, you'll survive probably unless the emotions get so negative and you keep trying to control, conceal, and uh, and cope with them that you implode. That can happen. It will happen eventually. But but maybe you can survive for a while that way. And but you're not you're not your fullest self. You're that part of you that is feeling something and trying not to feel it at the same time is always walking with you, working with you, always there. And so I think that's why I was pushing you earlier of like that overwhelmed feeling. Like sit with it for just a minute because. I think what I've learned is if I can sit with that for a minute, it doesn't come out sideways. It doesn't come out mm. angry. It actually, it actually comes out vulnerable and issues an invitation for someone else to share with me like their hard thing. And so, you know, I just had to figure out, it's like, this is what amazed me about this subject is largely the only books I could find on it were written by counselors, psychiatrists, neuroscientists, that's who writes about emotions. And I was like, where are the theologians? I looked, I'm a, I'm a seminary student. Um, I graduated from Dallas Theological. And I called my seminary professors up and said, hey, can you find me books? Because I'm having a hard time in my research. He called me back. He was like, Jenny, there's no books. Like, Wow. There's like three that he found that were good. And I read them and they weren't that good. Um, <laughs> they were kind of like, um and not boring like a typical, they just were all over. It was like, what are you trying to say? And, and so I, I, you know, and his, his words were, I guess the thinkers never stopped to think about the feelings. And yet, is there a bigger topic in the world right now than emotional health or, or emotions? And the church isn't equipped with a theological understanding of emotions. That set me, that set me kind of angry. And so when I really looked at like, what does God say? Because I had all the questions going in that anyone that picks up this book is going to have, which is, aren't emotions a sin? Aren't they getting us all in a lot of trouble right now? Isn't the world kind of following all its heart and desires and it's ending up a mess? I understand. Those are real valid questions and, and it's true. But the same root that causes someone to suppress their emotions and hurt other people because of that 
is the same root and problem that causes someone to emotionally act out and ruin and destroy their life because of the choices they're making. It's the same. They don't understand God's desire for it and heart for it, and they don't understand what they're supposed to do when they feel something. And so I would say the biggest place it broke down for everybody is in our families. And let's be real. I broke my kids too. There are two of them are in therapy and the other two will go soon. Like we're, mm-hmm. we, it's not like we got this right, but we talk about it and it's fun. My, my daughter's going to actually host the teaching portion of the season. She's going to host me teaching it. And the reason I asked her to do that, she's very emotional, is she's like the credibility that I, I, I didn't know this and now I'm learning it. And us working out the tension of even just how I raised her and the things I would say that hurt her, I think will be helpful for people. Because I don't know that any of us are quite getting this right. But largely it was from our family of origin. In the trenches, what are some of the things you said or believed that looking back on it now, not knowing what you know now, were maybe some of the most the things that you regret the most that you're like, Oh, Um, if I could get back, like my five-year-old, I wouldn't do this. Yeah. It's real clear to me with that one because she was such a feeler and she brought me every feeling she ever felt. And she still does. It's really precious. And I'm, I'm so grateful she didn't give up on me. Um, And she was mature enough, emotionally mature enough to say what she needed, but, but she would bring me a sadness, a grief. She would call me with something someone had said at school, something that, had happened with a boy that she liked and and now they were dating someone else right in front of her. And she would call and she would cry. And I would listen. I did a good job at that. But then as soon as she was done, I came in with my answer and my advice. I think almost every single time we respond to someone's pain with I think. Those exact words. I've noticed it now. And I did that because I wanted to be helpful. It wasn't an ill-intended move, right? I wanted to fix her problem. But her problem was 10% of what was wrong on the phone. 90% is how she felt about her problem. It was her sadness, her, her fear about the future. It wasn't about boy. <laughs> she knew that she knew pragmatically we all know the answer to our problems. We we all know what could fix our problem. That's largely not what we're doing when we go to someone to share a problem. We're going because of the 90%. We're going because of the what we feel about our problems. And when I try to fix the 10%, I negate the 90% of what she needs. And and she would even say to me, and I remember saying it over and over again, even at a young age. I don't want you to fix me right now, mom. And that was a good cue for me. And I would stop. But I didn't know what to do after that. I didn't know other than just listen and be quiet. And what I've learned, what I've learned is to say, instead of I think after someone shares something difficult, to say, I feel. So when I hear about your two-year-old Self, I feel sad that there wasn't an adult there to sweep you up and to protect you. I feel angry that that some part of you at that young of an age had learned to be to blame yourself for that situation. I feel I feel excited that 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 boy would grow up and his main thing would become shocker to help rescue people from those very fears and and hopeless feelings that you felt. I mean, like that, God also planted that in you in that moment. So I feel all of that when you share that story. And that's probably just even a little bit of what I felt, not to mention all the things everybody else felt when you shared. But when I share that, that feels very different than you shouldn't feel that way. Okay, now you've got me emotional. <laughs> okay, See? I'm like, how did I get that whole story? And uh, like, now you got me emotional. Why? Why? Because I haven't heard those words when mm. I've told. I haven't shared that story a lot, and I haven't heard those words around that story. And what does I feel it make you feel to hear how I feel? Comforted. Mm. 
comforted, heard, seen, yeah, safe. Yeah. And it's emotional. Don't ask me why it's emotional. It's emotional. Jenny, thank you. That's a that's a gift. Yeah. And I think it's the gift we are all craving. And it's something, I mean, I, I guess maybe let me just say this to people. Like, it's something we actually can learn. Like, yeah. I'm not good at that. I learned that. I learned yes. to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I let other people do it for me. And just like you, I would weep at little things that I didn't understand why I was weeping, but it was so helpful to hear someone be angry at what happened to me when I was five years old. It's to hear someone I love be angry about that. That was a new feeling. And I think we're all craving this. And, and, and to just real quickly slap a Bible verse on it, a couple, mourn with those who mourn. Mourn with those who mourn. That's what we're craving. We're, it, it, it's something our brain was made for. That when we suffer, we don't suffer alone. We were built neurologically. I mean, this is where the science comes into the Bible. We were built neurologically to not suffer alone. When we suffer alone, that is when neuropathways break and trauma lasts. When we suffer with someone, we can actually regrow neuropathways that are broken. Like it is actually healing to mourn with those who mourn. Our brains actually heal. And so what just happened with us just now is I was with a two-year-old, you, that needed a friend, that needed to hear he's not alone. Because that part of you, again, it's just, it'd be great if we could seal off compartments and chapters of our life and go, okay, this part isn't going to bleed into this part and isn't going to bleed into my marriage. And it isn't, surely it's not going to bleed into my parenting, but it does. And all those little moments teach us how the world works and how we're supposed to be in a lot. It's a lot. Jenny, one of the other problems, and thank you for that. That's uh, that's actually more of a gift than you realize. Thank you. Mm. I, I feel it. I feel warm. I feel comforted. Mm. One of the other problems you write about in Untangle Your Emotions is you mentioned a season in your life a few years ago where you went numb. Mm-hmm. And if listeners are listening at this point, there are some leaders listening who would say, I feel nothing. That story didn't move me. The <laughs> story of revival didn't move me. You're not nothing crying. moved me. What? I'm dead. Uh, <laughs> like, and I've been there. You've been there. I've, I've been, been there. there. I've been where, there. You know, in my season of burnout back in 06, I, I felt nothing anymore. And it was the worst feeling yeah. to feel nothing, if that makes any sense, where I was just flat. The highs didn't hit me. The lows didn't hit me. You could have told me the world was going to blow up in 20 seconds and I would have been like, "Eh, all right, that's fine. Um, Tell us about that season in your life when you went numb, what happened. Uh, Yeah, just go there if you would. Yeah, you know, it was after COVID. And I mean, I think so many of us probably went through that same feeling in that year of just, it was too much. It was too much. We were getting hit. I mean, if you start just on a national level um, and then moving to a global level, you got 2016, all the division and that there's so much just tension everywhere. And you head into COVID and you think, oh, this is going to be our moment where we all heal together and it's hard and we're going to rally. And then everybody's even more divided than ever. And every, I think everybody just, it was too much. And I think a lot of us just checked out. I think a lot of us at some point, that is a defense mechanism that your brain can do that. It's a pretty cool feature. And Specifically, when you think of the times it absolutely has to do that, um, and there have been those times in my life. Another time I'd gone numb was when my husband was going through a deep, deep depression years ago. We had just brought our son home from Africa. Um, he was running into the streets in front of cars um, to just be funny, like Superman. He'd seen a movie or something, and he was holding knives and throwing them. And I mean, it was. And that's just two of 23 other things just as hard as that. And if I felt anything, I would have crumbled and I couldn't. That was a helpful feature in my brain to be able to be numb in that season to get through it. I was a Navy SEAL. I did what I needed to do every day and I didn't feel my emotions. And I even write in the book, you may be in that moment where to feel all of this is just, it's not the moment for it. You've got to survive. Some Your husband just died and you've got three kids and you've got to figure out how to make breakfast tomorrow morning. I get it. 
it's a cool feature. But I remember my counselor saying to me, you know what happens to, to Navy SEALs that never turn that part of their brain back on? They, they're the people that end up in shooting somebody out of road rage at an intersection. Because there's a reality to compassion and joy and anger and sadness that if you never turn that part of your brain back on to feel those things, you become very unhealthy. And, and it will come out some way. And if there's one plea, if you're that one and you're listening and you're like, I've been numb for a long time, and I would say this specifically to leaders, because we've been there. I mean, part of that season I just mentioned, Zach was transitioning our church. He had been leading so hard and so long that he was completely burnt out. That's why he was in depression. So we, we get leadership. And I would just say, if that's you and you've been there for so long, I would just say, let me motivate you out of your friendships, your children, your grandchildren. It does come out. I mean, we all know the cranky granddad that nobody wants to go visit. We all know them. Like, that's, that's a reality. Why? Because they never dealt with their interior life and what they were feeling, and they stuffed it, and it comes out. It comes out some way or another. And so out of just wanting to be the best mom or dad or grandfather or father or friend or worker or follower of Jesus, like just this is, this work is worth it. And, and don't be afraid. And, and I like to say this too, that, that what I feel like sometimes I'm doing with this book and this message is, is I'm asking you to come like to this abyss, to the edge, and you're going to look over the abyss and you're going to go, I don't, why would I go down there? Like who wants to go into a dark abyss, right? Nobody wants to go to a dark abyss, but I, I want to tell you that there's handles down there. It's not, it's not black emptiness. God is down there. <laughs> People that need you and love you are down there. And, and there's ways to feel these things without them overtaking you. And you can go in and you can take a step and you can feel sad. Wow. And it might feel like it is overcoming you for a minute. And it might be for weeks and months. I mean, mm. we, we know mental health in our family. I mean, my, my husband's entered depression more than once. Once while I was writing this book. And so we're here to get help, you know, in the middle of me writing this book. So, so we know about it. I know that there are times it feels like it might just overtake you. But here's what's so cool is while I'm writing this book and my husband goes through this, I'll just tell his story because he's given me permission. He, I mean, still it makes me cry because it's so recent, but he did it so beautifully. Like, I remember we were sitting there and he's like, here's the facts about the situation I'm in. Here's how I feel. I'm not doing well. I've already reached out to a counselor. I've already reached out to get help. And I said, okay, what are we going to do? And he looked at me and he put his hand on my, me, writing the book about emotions, put his hand on my leg and said, we're going to be sad together. And I, we both just cried about this circumstance. And we cried and we cried the next day. And there were a lot of times that we were just crying and we weren't talking. And I watched him be sad in front of me. and. He was so good at it. I'm not. He's so good at it. And months later, you know, the book takes so long to write. I'm finishing the book. And we took walks this whole time at night together. And I remember right as I'm finishing the book, we were walking and he kept laughing about things. And I was like, man, the power of feeling is that you get to the other side. <laughs> but the power of not feeling is that it puts you in bondage in ways you can't even see and possibly for decades. So I'll do this. I'll go down into the abyss and I'll feel what I feel and I'll, I'll invite you to come and I'll, I'll say there's handles and there's ways to do this and it's worth it because it is. And it's such a better way of life. I, I think this, may, I want to end this part here just to say that in the middle of it, like the next day after we went through this circumstance, it had to do with his business. And 
And it just meant a lot for us financially and possibly even like some like moving or, or making some really big, hard decisions. And, and so we had to sit down and tell our kids, like, here's where things are today. And, and my son wrote my husband a letter that night. And he, it was the most beautiful thing you've ever heard. I wish I had it right here. But it said, Dad, and, and again, my, dad, my husband just cried with our kids and said, this is where we are. And it was so honest. And it was so vulnerable. And, and he wrote this letter. And it was, I just want you to know, Dad, that watching you succeed and watching you fail, I want to be just like you. And I love not only the man you are, but the businessman you are. And he just honored him. It was like, it was paragraph after paragraph after paragraph. And I thought about that letter and I was like, if if he hadn't have done that, if he hadn't just broken down with my kids, even though uh, people could judge that all day and just say like, tell your kids what they need to know. But, but he felt with them. He invited them into what he was going through and what he was feeling. And he he expected their sadness too for disappointments of not being able to travel for a while or not being able to, by them think, you know, just the natural disappointments about where we were in that moment. And yet he got the greatest connection with my son and the greatest affirmation that any father would just pray to hear any time in their life. And so we're so afraid of this. And yet I think it's the way to life. It's the way to experience the life that God intended us to live. Is that how it happened for you, getting out of numbness too? Did you start to process your emotions? Like I so appreciate what your husband did in yeah, saying, we're too. just going to be sad for a minute. And it's funny because you're making me reflect on my deep depression almost 20 years ago. And I think I felt the sadness before I felt the happiness. Mm. Hadn't really put two and two together. But yeah, I think the negative emotions surface first after the numbness. And then when I sat with them for a while, the positive ones started to flicker back. I'll never forget the first time I just, I'll tell you when the switch flipped. Yeah, yeah. Is I'd been asked to join this little cohort of leaders. And I said yes, because I was desperate and I wanted to quit work. I, I just was empty. Numbness leads to apathy and apathy leads to emptiness and hopelessness. And so that's where I was headed. I wouldn't say I was at hopeless yet, but I was definitely at apathetic. And and I was scared and worried because I don't, I'm, as everybody on this podcast can tell, I'm kind of passionate person. <laughs> um, so that wasn't a good place to be for me. And I sat down with this group and Kurt Thompson was there and I'd met Kurt before and I knew kind of what was in store and he was going to make me feel my feelings. And my typical posture with Kurt up until this point had been arms crossed, staring at him, barely answering his questions. Because I just, I just didn't want to play. I just felt like, what's the point? And that day I came in different. I was like, I'm pretty desperate. I want to see a change. I'm going to do what he says. And we were supposed to start by just telling our story. And I literally wept. I don't even know that they understood all the words I said. I just wept and I yelled. And I said, I feel used by God. I feel like he's called me out on the ocean where feet may fail and my feet have failed multiple times. And I'm, I'm just angry and I'm, I'm yelling and I'm sad and I'm crying. And I thought, wow, I just did that assignment right for the first time ever with Kurt Thompson. And my friends started saying things like, well, God's not like that. God." God wouldn't use you like that. I just don't think. And all of a sudden, like this anger rose up in me because I thought I just poured out my guts to you and you're telling me I'm wrong. Like God's right and what I feel is wrong. And Kurt wisely looked at everybody and said, hold on, Jenny, what do you feel when they say that? And I had a choice in that moment. I could have, I could have said, I don't know. They're probably right. But I didn't. I said, I'm, I'm ticked. And I think I used a better word than that. And I said, I feel like you're judging me. Like, I was brave for me. I never do that. I never say all those things. I've never said any of those things out loud. And I just said it, and I was brave. 
and y'all are telling me like what I feel is wrong. Like I shouldn't feel it. And and it was just so dear. Anne was in the room and it, Anne probably was the first one that spoke and said, I just feel so sad that you feel judged and I feel so proud of you for keeping to follow God even though you've been angry and even though you've been sad. And then all these people started doing what I just did. I feel... Um, and, and so after that, he said, you know, here's how we're going to, this is what we're going to do. These are the rules. We're only going to say, I feel rather than I think after everything. And I, unless I had lived it where my heart softened, I could have been angry at them all night and not wanted to be a part of that group anymore. But instead I felt closer to them after that, when they, when they moved into my anger and felt, felt compassion and appreciation for me and and sad with me and angry with me when I felt all that from them. Like I had this huge exhale. I felt safe again in the room. I even felt like a lot of those feelings weren't as strong with God. I was like, I feel better. I feel like I, I it just it, it changed me. And unless that had happened, I don't think I would have believed it would work. But I, it was, I mean, for me, I mean, when I think about your question, how'd you stop being numb? It was on that drive that I was saying, I'm apathetic, I'm apathetic, I'm numb. And it was after that moment that everything began to change. And it was just a new way of living of I feel rather than I think. And we think that's driven by your emotions and all the negative things we've heard about that. But the reality is, is if you really start to believe they're from God, and you really start to believe like they're gifts and that God wants to do something good through them, not something bad. In your anger, do not sin. The assumption is our anger isn't the sin, but what we do after the anger is the sin. If we can mm-hmm. figure out what to do in that relationship with anger, with sadness, with fear, then I think it's the greatest life in the world. You know, it's a boring documentary or it's an epic, beautiful story. And I pick epic, beautiful story today. <laughs> There is so much that we didn't even touch. I mean, you got a five-fold framework to notice, name, feel, share, and choose. I love the reference to Winston Churchill about his coping (laughs) mechanisms. Can you say, right? just before we wrap up, real briefly, tell us about Winston Churchill. Oh, and the yeah. Second World I War. mean, I've always been fascinated with Winston Churchill. And Same. if you've ever read or watched anything about him, he's always in a bathtub. I mean, I, I can't yeah. remember the recent movie, but he's always in a bathtub or he's in his bed. Those are the two places. Like, Winston's making huge decisions about the war, like from his bath. And I just always thought that was funny. And I, kind of related to it, you know? (laughs) And I think, and I I think for me, like watching him always be in his bath and bed, it's like, of course he was, the whole world was falling apart, right? Um, I think about my friend, Melissa Russell said this, like we, of course we crave that comfort. If, if you're sending men off to their death and you're fighting for the salvation of the world, like that's what Churchill was up against Germany owning all of Europe. You've got, it's very uncomfortable and it's very hard. And so of course you're going to cope with that in your bathtub, in your bed. So I think, you know, I, I tried throughout the whole book just to have so much grace for wherever people are, because I think we want there to be a right way to do all this. And it's, that's not how this thing works. You know, some things are that way, but emotion, be, a right way to be sad. It's just, no, there's, that, yeah. now there's a way many ways that honor God in that. But it is, I think, beating the table in anger at God for times that you feel, I think he welcomes that. I think he loves when we come to him as kids and we're hitting the table and we're mad. I think he loves when we come to him and we're crying. And we've told ourselves, you can't do that. And God's like, what do you know, David? I gave a whole lot of the Bible to David because he was a big old mess. And all he did was yell at me and cry with me. And I just, I did that to show you how to lament, to show you how to talk to me when you're mad. Like, I want you to engage with me. And now as a parent of older grown kids, I get that. How miserable if they're angry at me and walk away and don't say it. Like that's where, mm-hmm. that's where it gets scary. I'd rather them come up and go, mom, that made me mad because da, 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 da. Oh man, I didn't even see it that way. I'm so sorry. Like I can make that right. I can't make it right with the kid that just storms off and won't tell me what he feels. So I think my hope is this just changes everything. The whole framework of how 
you do life. But there's so much grace that sometimes we need a bathtub and sometimes we need a bed <laughs> and sometimes we need to cuss. And some, well, that's really not biblical, but yell, let's just go with yell. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we need to hit a table and sometimes we need to cry and not even know why we're doing it. And all of that can be holy and not the cussing. Let me be clear, mm. but all of the <laughs> other stuff can be holy. And so, you know, that's, I'm just finding that that's just a more full, healthy way to live. Jenny, this has been so rich. The book is called <laughs> Untangle Your Emotions. Um, it's available everywhere. And we need more conversations like this. And I can't thank you enough for this one mm. today. You've been very I generous you, with Carrie. your time, but also with your heart and with showing up. And just thank you for showing up for hundreds of thousands of leaders every single year, maybe more. You, you've, mm. You're really making a difference. And uh, you're making a difference with me too. So thank mm. you. Um, if people want to connect with you online, where's a good place to do that these days? Where Everything they find we work on is at under JennyAllen.com, J-E-N-N-I-E-A-L-L-E-N.com. Beautiful. Jenny, till next time. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie.